Welcome everybody to EU 37, the big celebration about EU enlargement today at the day. It's the 1st of May 2004. I was personally celebrating at the Austrian Slovenian border together with Paul Rubik, the member of the European Parliament, because of the 10 new countries joining the European Union 18 years ago. In the meantime, we have uh, Bulgaria, Romania and Croatia as well, 13 new countries, 100 million new European Union citizens in the last 18 years. That's a historic achievement of the European Union. It's uh, astonishing, actually, also the progress economically, pl politically and security wise. Just imagine in what kind of crisis we would be if Bulgaria and Romania would not be in the European Union and in NATO right now because of uh, the terrible war in Ukraine. And we are much more secure because of EU enlargement. We are much more safer and it's a time to celebrate this amazing progress. And that's what we are doing here today with Vienna Goes Europe. I would like to welcome Kati Schneeberger, our president. Thanks a lot for your leadership. You were the first one to do an event for EU 37 in Vienna at the Diplomatic Academy with Ambassador Bimo from Albania, who I am very honored to welcome. Bravo Ambassador, thanks a lot for your time and for your support and your excellent speech and uh, plaidoyer, I would say, advocacy for a united Europe together with Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Albania, Kosovo, Montenegro. This is really amazing support from your side. I just welcome all the new participants simultaneously. And then, yes, 100 million um, Europeans. I personally celebrated at the Austrian-Slovenian border. Many of us have celebrated together at this important day. And now we want uh, to advocate uh, for the next wave of enlargement, nine new countries. And obviously also Peter is here from the United Kingdom to build a Europe which the United Kingdom wants to come back and joins in the future as well. That would be, of course, so important for us because it's such an important economy, an important ally in the situation, in, of course, in NATO. It's the United Kingdom which was so decisive to save Ukraine. And we are all very grateful for your important contribution to the security of Ukraine, to the defense of Ukraine. And that shows how important it would be to have the United Kingdom back in the European Union in the future EU of 37. And that is our aim. And I just want to outline, we have now the big summits uh, on the 23rd of June. There will be the EU summit where the decisions about EU enlargement will be taken. And uh, that is, of course, the reason for building a powerful network in the coming weeks and months in order to influence these uh, decisions to make sure that enlargement gets a big boost with all our help and all the countries can join. That is uh, the plan of EU 37. I would like now to ask Kati Schneeberger, our president, to give her opening statement. Please, Kati, the floor is yours. Thank you, Punta. <laughs> uh, welcome to the celebration of EU enlargement and allow me as the president of Benagos Europe to call for a new drive for EU enlargement as part of the conference of the future of Europe. I call for EU membership of Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Albania, Montenegro, North Macedonia, Republic of Kosovo, Serbia and Bosnia. In face of the Russian aggression and war against Ukraine, we have to enlarge the European Union much faster. EU enlargement is the European answer and contribution of the uh, European Union to security, stability and prosperity in Eastern and Southeastern Europe. And the enlarged Europe, including Ukraine and all nine new countries must be attractive to the EU United Kingdom to return to the EU. All this must be possible by 2029. This is uh, EU uh, 37 by 2029, and we must prepare the public for that. We need effective networks in EU member states and in the nine accession countries and in the UK to make that happen. Unicos Europe will serve as hub in Austria to change the attitudes of Austria politics and public on the enlargement debate. Uh, first thing is to celebrate EU enlargement of 
24 to 2013 as major success. That is what we do today. And to make constant debate and public pressure as we started with the uh, uh, 31 March um, EU 37 panel debate in the Diplomatic Academy. I started with the campaigning uh, during the visit to Albania in April and I will visit all nine countries until uh, 2023 to campaign for EU enlargement. We will continue to make events and campaign and I call all friends to campaign for EU 37 together. We need a strong and more united Europe, including 37 members. That's, that is why I say yes to Ukraine in EU, yes to Georgia in EU, yes to Moldova in EU, yes to Albania in EU, yes to Montenegro in EU, yes to North Macedonia in EU, Yes to Republic of Kosovo in EU, yes to Bosnia in EU, yes to Serbia in EU, and yes to United Kingdom back in EU. Thanks for our friends and participation and let's build a strong and powerful network for EU enlargement together. Thanks a lot, Mrs. President. Uh, excellent speech. This is the call of EU 37 to be united, to be open, to be strong. I would like now to welcome all the participants and also I'm with a short question from the 10 countries, from the Hello. nine enlargement countries and the United Kingdom to make a short introduction round. Mr. Ambassador Bimo, maybe first of all, uh, we are very honored that you are here with us. And does Albania want to join the European Union? Just unmute yourself. Okay, I hope that I am audible Perfect. now. Very okay. good. Welcome. Well, Madam President Schneeberger, dear uh, Gunther, dear all friends and, and uh, participants in this uh, online meeting, <clears throat> it's indeed a, a pleasure to be uh, today with you. I don't know how much we will achieve to uh, establish new friendships, which I think uh, this platform is a very good uh, venue for making use of it to introduce to uh, new friends and uh, people that uh, think along the same lines and uh, very much like-minded. It's a great opportunity that uh, uh, President Schleberger and uh, Gunter thought about celebrating the uh, enlargement is a <clears throat> milestone in the, in the uh, life of the European Union which I think uh, those who are in somehow do not appreciate as much as uh, those who are out of this uh, 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 community of nations. And uh, uh, together with the, the, the pleasure uh, and, the, and the honor that uh, you have showed by inviting me to be part of this, uh, I was thinking that uh, indeed is a Sunday and uh, on Sunday people celebrate. But on the other side, I, I see this as much as a very hard work that all of us are putting together to uh, lobby in favor of enlargement. And I pray that many uh, others who do not think along the same lines as us would uh, be uh, aware of uh, what we are doing and the hopes and the, in the uh, desires of the nations that are in the vicinity of the European Union to become part of this initiative. So uh, maybe uh, I think we'll go round of introductions and perhaps we'll have the opportunity to say a few more words about the uh, subject matter of, of the Albania stands and what are our, our expectations and hope. So uh, in a uh, nutshell, thank you very much for doing this. Uh, uh, happy to be with everybody else in this platform and uh, looking very much forward to a successful uh, proceedings of this uh, meeting today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador, for your continuous support. And we are all for European Albania. Join the European Union very fast. That's very positive for the security. And also Albania, a strong NATO ally. Let's not forget since 2009 already very successfully in NATO. Now I would like to welcome Professor Alush Kashi, the president of uh, Institute for Foreign uh, Relation of Kosovo, and also one of the founding fathers of the Republic of Kosovo. Professor Gashi, the floor is yours. 
Well, uh, thank you, Gunter. Greetings to all participants. Well, in Kosovo, we are really very grateful for uh, all the support we we got and we are getting from the European Union. Actually, every third Kosovars in different forms live in the European Union, most in Germany, Switzerland, and other countries. And they have uh, really become uh, uh, part of the societies where they live, where they are integrated, and in their capacity, they are contributing to development of European countries in politics, in economy, in sports, and arts. Uh, every day, number of uh, representatives in those countries, people who get elected, is increasing. Um, the big interaction between uh, uh, Kosovars who are currently living in European countries uh, are contributing to development in Kosovo and region in different forms. Of course, uh, we have our hiccups uh, between uh, Kosovo and, uh, and EU countries. Uh, mostly has to do with uh, visa liberalization. And uh, all those issues uh, are sort of uh, creating problems in daily reality, especially after uh, the European Parliament has recognized over four years that Kosovo has uh, fulfilled all uh, the criteria for visa liberalization. But despite those problems, I strongly believe that uh, Kosovo will uh, continue to aspire to be a member of EU. We will uh, uh, do our best to, to fulfill all needed criteria. And uh, we as a European nation, we have no other address. Uh, EU is our address and we strongly believe that uh, with a develop, positive development process in, uh, in Albania, North Macedonia and our region, we may even uh, uh, be blessed that we all jointly uh, get to EU, which of course is a big skepticism in some of EU countries, but the uh, situation in Ukraine is really uh, unveiling uh, new tectonic uh, changes in, in global arena. And maybe uh, EU decision makers may take into consideration to get some uh, bold decisions. Now, it's widely known that the uh, size of the country uh, is not the most important factor. Uh, we have small countries who are uh, really doing great contribution, for example, uh, work of Albania in NATO and uh, their openness and uh, their chemistry for region stability and others. It's uh, uh, the best example that uh, uh, EU values have deeply penetrated in Western Balkans. Thank you. Gunther. Thanks, Professor Gashi, uh, for your contribution and also for your clear yes uh, to EU membership of Republic of Kosovo. Now I would like to welcome Natalia from uh, Ukraine, Natalia Tereshenko, please, uh, does Ukraine want to join the European Union? Uh, thank you, Gunther. Yes, uh, Ukrainian um, people want to join EU and more than 91% uh, of uh, Ukrainians stand for EU and EU, uh, EU values in Ukraine. I was asked uh, several days ago, how do Ukrainians uh, see European values? And I want to say that we don't even uh, call it into a question. We live European values in our daily life in Ukraine. And in my opinion, Ukraine can enrich EU with a lot of things as uh, democracy, as freedom of speech, as uh, human rights. We stand for human rights, especially you see it uh, when uh, Russian side uh, tries to uh, take Ukrainians in prison, yes? Horrible facts when um, 
uh, regis reg um, directors of movies got in prison, for example, and this was made artificially uh, by Russian side. Yeah. Um, I was living nine years in Vienna and I decided that I want to live in Ukraine because it is a very nice country. It is good to live there in Ukraine. I was already in Ukraine since December and unfortunately on the first day on the 24th of February when the Russian invasion uh, got us, I had uh, to come back to Vienna again. And my life was ruined. All my plans in Ukraine were ruined by uh, uh, Russian aggression and Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, I think that Ukraine and EU can learn from each other. We can fulfill each other. Uh, we can learn from EU, for example, how to structure our systems uh, and you can learn from us, uh, uh, for example, how it is um, easy to make uh, decisions, uh, what is freedom of speech, uh, what is uh, to secure your country, which is uh, the most important nowadays. Thank you. Natalia, very much. thanks a lot. We are all standing in full solidarity with Ukraine Thank and you. it's really terrible what Russia is doing to you and be sure of the solidarity of Vienna Goes Europe. You know that and uh, all the best and thanks for your clear yes uh, to uh, Ukraine in the European Union. Thanks, Natalia. Thank you. Thank you now, much. I would like to give the floor to Ludmila from uh, Moldova. Do you want to join the European Union? Yes, of course, <laughs> not only I, um, uh, uh, the first I would like to say thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, uh, meeting, uh, very essential in my opinion, and uh, good morning uh, to all participants uh, and uh, dear uh, Katja Schneiberger. Um, of course, to be part of uh, European Union or um, to be citizens of uh, European Union is not only my desire, is um, uh, but also uh, a desire of our people, people from Moldova. And uh, the questions why it's I think it, it's it's simple it's visible because we um, identify our values with European values and I mean here. Uh, primary democracy, human rights, freedom, and special now what is uh, in the situation in Ukraine, the values uh, uh, which promote the peace and uh, the, uh, 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 well-being of people. It's very, very important for us. Um, we realize that the future of Moldova uh, it will be in uh, in Europe only, and um, I think uh, the development and the security of Republic Moldova ensure the security of European Union. That's why it's very important the integration of the Republic uh, Republic Moldova in the integrate uh, in European Union. It's, um, it uh, must be priority number one, not only uh, for the government of Republic, uh, Republic Moldova, uh, sorry, but uh, also for Brussels. And um, at the end, uh, I, can, I can say, or I hope, I hope uh, with your engagement, with our engagement uh, in the future, I can, and say that I am a citizen of uh, um, of European family. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Moldova is very welcome in the European Union. Thanks, Ludmila, for your great effort, excellent speech, and hope for a fast membership of uh, Moldova. Thank you. I would like to welcome now our representative, Mr. Subotic from Serbia. Does Serbia want to join the European Union? Please, you're welcome. 
Thank you. That's an excellent question, particularly now these complicated uh, times. Uh, we as European Policy Center keep arguing that uh, uh, enlargement needs to be uh, re-energized, that Serbia and the other Western Balkan countries should be given a chance, despite some hiccups in uh, the uh, regional relationships and the relationships with, uh, uh, with uh, the EU. Uh, we've been doing this for the past 10 years. We've marked our 10th anniversary as a think tank, uh, the most uh, highly ranked think tank in the region. Uh, we've been uh, focusing on how to identify flaws of the enlargement policy, but also identifying uh, flaws in policies of our government. So it was a two-way uh, street always for us. However, uh, in 2018, we've identified that the then enlargement policy is not uh, going to produce the desired uh, result, which is uh, having uh, Western Balkan six uh, as future members of the EU. Later on, this was picked up by uh, the French, and then uh, we uh, ended up with the revised enlargement uh, methodology. So as early as 2018, we argued that there is an enlargement impasse, that the methodology is not specific enough when it comes to measuring the results in the region. At the same time, it's not incentivizing for the political elites and not uh, producing tangible results for the citizens of uh, the region. Hence why you can see that uh, even in those countries which have a, a high level of EU uh, support, for example, Montenegro, uh, Macedonia, so not specifically talking only about Serbia here, you can see that their uh, uh, appreciation of the EU institutions, that is their level of trust is actually quite low and that they are increasingly even open for other uh, geostrategic partners uh, uh, such as uh, China. Uh, and we also, as the European Policy Center, have also argued that uh, the Western Balkans uh, should be included for geostrategic reasons as well. Without including the region, uh, we argue that the European project will never be fully completed. And the crisis in Ukraine has actually actually showed us that, uh, reminded us that the only with the, uh, Europe complete, we can talk about uh, a complete uh, and firm position of a European continent as a stable, prosperous, and peaceful continent. Uh, that's all for now. Uh, I'm open to talk about our concrete proposals on how we can overcome this impasse, how we can operationalize the, the revised methodology, which hasn't really produced the desired results so far. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Supotic uh, Strahina. I would like to thank you very much. Also, EPC uh, Serbia is a very important uh, policy think tank, and we are grateful for your participation and also for your contribution. Also, maybe in the future to work very closely together on EU enlargement between Belgrade and Vienna. That would be very good because it's absolutely important to build a consensus for EU enlargement now in all countries. Of course, there are many complications but we can celebrate this. Today, the 1st of May, is a big day for unity and enlargement. I would like to welcome and ask Peter Cook from the United Kingdom. Do you want to come back to the Un European Union? One word, yes. <clears throat> but I'll add a little, if I may. Firstly, a heartfelt apology to all of our European friends here from UK. On, I, 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 I'm taking Boris Johnson's voice in vain here i'm apologizing on behalf of all of the <laughs> citizens of the uk for brexit um we have noted you might not have noted this in the press that surrounds uh, our right-wing press but the mood of brexit has changed significantly here uh, only the very hardline noisy people that you hear of such as nigel farage still want brexit many people who voted for it have gone silent We've spoken to people all over. We've been campaigning for the local elections. People realised that they were uh, sold huge doses of misinformation. Vladimir Putin sponsored Brexit to a high level. He came on the Western Front. Now he comes on the Eastern Front to squeeze. We must stop this. People are actually realising now that they were duped and lied to. So... However, I'm under no illusions that we've been very, very bad. We deserve punishment for our sins uh, for a while. And until we have leavened and, and removed the culture carriers of Brexit, I think there are several conditions that ought to be put into the EU's uh, procedures for 
letting us con you know, considering letting us come back. One of them is that we cut out our English exceptionalism that gave us Brexit. There is proof now from economists. Uh, I was at a conference on Wednesday that seven years of austerity uh, produced a four to twelve percent percent swing in our right wing UKIP vote, and that delivered Brexit. Uh, so we had that great big downturn and then we were promised these sunny uplands. Yeah, sunny uplands do not exist, as I'm sure you know. Um, so we must fight the forces that actually delivered this Brexit and we must therefore um, properly understand that to join a club, you have to play with the rules rather than have your cake and eat it. So I humbly thank you for your invite. And I would love to come back when we're ready. I think we need a, a huge dose, not of cake, but of humble pie. Thanks a lot. That was an excellent statement, especially also to show the Russian involvement in the Brexit campaign. This is underreported in the European Union. We should make it very clear there is a strategic threat to Europe from all sides with the Trump support with Brexit. And now with this terrible war, this is the Russian strategy and we have to fight it by more unity inside Thank EU and NATO. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Peter. That's excellent. Now I would like to welcome uh, Krasen, Professor Krasen. I would like to introduce you as one of the most uh, important and famous professors of economics in Eastern Europe, one of the advocates for Bulgarian EU membership, NATO membership and for EU enlargement already in the 90s professor at the Sofia University and a very uh, good friend of Ukraine has worked in all the countries of EU enlargement and performed excellently in assisting the economic transition of the countries to the progress. Professor Gassen, I'm very happy that you take time this morning. Can you share some of your in insights and also congratulations, congratulations because you are already in the European Union, <laughs> Bulgaria since 2007, so you can celebrate. Can you describe a little bit how it is and also talk about the EU enlargement? Thanks a lot, Professor Carson, for your time. Thank you, Gunther and Kathy, for, for inviting me. Uh, I tried my best to be on time. I uh, apologize to Macedonians and Albanians about uh, what the Bulgarian government is doing uh, to block their talks with the uh, EU for the membership. Um, so, unfortunately, you know, it's a political situation here, but I think we will change it. You know, I don't know when, you know, but I believe that we will. I have three points to make. Uh, number one is about life, number two is about economy, and number three is about the process of joining the EU. I think the latter should be changed, you know, for the countries we are talking about today. Something about life. Uh, Europe is a, is, a, is a symbol. And it's a symbol of freedom and it's a symbol of civilization. That's why our countries, who uh, mm -hmm. joined in 2004, 2007, were basically supportive. Everyone, every strata of the society was supportive for Germany. But something about freedom, mm -hmm. about liberty, the most important and most uh, easy to detect indicator of well-being and freedom is life, life expectancy. People cannot be a little bit dead and a little bit alive. Uh, and if you take uh, any population statistics, with this United Nations or the World Bank or our working data, you name it. And you check the countries we are speaking about, including, I just checked, uh, including uh, including the Balkan countries, including uh, uh, what happened uh, after the dissolution of the, uh, of the former Soviet Union, which was a great civilization achievement, by the way, uh, in 1990, 1991, what you see is that if the life expectancy of all the European countries uh, by the end of the uh, World War II was basically the same. So then in the eastern part of Europe, there was a bit of an improvement, very slow, until 1960. And then from 1960 to, uh, to, 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 to 1990, it stayed flat. And then in 1990, it started <laughs> improving the life expectancy of birth. It's just an amazing fact. 
nobody can explain this, you know, why it happened, but obviously there is something involved with civilization and freedom. So this is confirmed by, by, by economic data. And if you take, if you take uh, GDP per capita, for example, you will see that the new member states, that's why I shared one of these. Uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the recent articles I had on on the meta uh, related to COVID, but it has some economic study. So if you look the, at the, the GDP per capita for the new member states compared to the old member states, you see the same picture like with life expectancy. Until uh, I mean. After the World War One, uh, after World War Two, as World War One, everybody was basically at the same place. After World War Two, I mean, Western Europe was a bit at the end of the forties. It was a bit higher, so like ten, twelve, to fifteen percent higher in terms of GDP per capita than than the so-called Europe. And then, you know, during the communist years until 89, you know, Western Europe went up, Eastern Europe remained at one fourth of GDP per capita of Western Europe. And then there was a slow improvement. Uh, when the negotiations with, uh, with the EU started in 99, so the average uh, level of GDP per capita of New York was about one third of Europe, of the European Union. And if you take it now, 20 years later, it's about 73% of EU average. Even Bulgaria, which is uh, because of many reasons, you know, not the best performing country because of, you know, reintroduction of central planning in the mid 90s. So in, even Bulgaria is about 60, 61%. It will be 61, 62% by the end of the year in terms of uh, 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 comparison to the EU average GDP. And my last point is on the process. I don't think uh, that uh, uh, the deadline by 2000, uh, 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 2029 uh, is, uh, is, 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 a, is a proper message we should call for immediate membership uh, for one very simple reason. So the, the, the process is too political. It's related to different uh, uh, circumstances and nobody can predict the circumstances right now because of the war of Russia and Ukraine. So what can be done? And this was messaged uh, by uh, a friend of ours with Gunther uh, Gerald Knaus uh, earlier this week, but I did the same before the annexation of Crimea. We had a meeting on 12th of, uh, of March 2014, uh, lots of famous people, you know, Andrei Lyonov from Russia, Warren Coates from uh, the United States, uh, uh, Ivan Miklos from Slovakia, Enes Repas from, uh, from Latvia, me from Bulgaria, Kahab and the kids are from Georgia, with whom uh, all of us and I personally was a, was, a, was a friend. So we called for something to be done immediately, from one to the next day. And what we messaged then was what you do first is liberalize, liberalize, and liberalize the trade of Ukraine with the European Union unilaterally. It was done for the Western Balkans and it worked and it worked tremendously well. So if you look at today's uh, uh, share of sources of income for, for the Western Balkans population on average, 70 cents of every euro of income is because of the European Union, because of trading with the European Union, because having the opportunities to travel and that sort of stuff. The second thing was uh, free the labor market and movement and no visa and no labor restrictions. It is actually happening with Ukraine. There is no reason this is not to happen with 
uh, with the Western Balkans or Moldova or Georgia. That does not necessarily mean that people will immediately move you know, to Germany or Austria. This means that people are with a prospect for their future, nothing special. So this is the way the European Union can confirm the symbolic and civilization nature of the Union for the people who are outside the Union but wish to join. It. Uh, this does not necessarily mean that uh, the, the entire process uh, legalistic thing uh, shall be changed. This may happen immediately and this is the only assurance that it will happen legally and formally. Thank Professor, you. thanks a lot for your powerful advocacy and explanation in Bulgaria. You are very lucky inside already, and it is a big success with now 61% of the living standards of the European Union. Yeah. That's a big success, uh, actually. Uh, part of it is because of COVID, actually, because uh, GDP per capita, you know, when you have less people, you know, it's higher. But of course, Bulgaria it's was also Bulgaria. in all. Bulgaria was on the second uh, uh, place in the world in terms of that uh, 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 of Can you shortly also, um, beside the major success of Bulgaria and the EU enlargement in general, with 100 million people now in the European Union successfully free, secure, and prosperous, mm -hmm. can you also, um, about um, the situation in Bulgaria, maybe one question about uh, the veto towards Macedonia and Albania? This was a very damaging thing. Do you see some light now that there will be a better European enlargement policy of the new government of Kirill Petkov? Uh, yes, uh, it's much better than it used to be at the end of 1919 and uh, in uh, 2020. Last year we had uh, three times general elections and one presidential election. Uh, so this stopped the, 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 the process and uh, had some sort of a rolling back you know to very much uh, xenophobic towards Macedonia uh, uh, attitude of the major political parties but uh, with pressure from inside pressure from the European Union and with uh, with with this uh, prime minister in place you know I hope uh, and of course also also the the, the, the the general situation is helpful I think you know that by the end of the year we will have a major breakthrough in this. And this will be, I mean, they invented something which is not legally there, you know, uh, these political parties and the president of Albania. They invented uh, uh, some constitutional issue to, to argue about with Macedonia, which is not part of any formal criteria for any country to join and which is not in the contracts between the two countries, which is not in the decisions of different Bulgarian decision-making bodies, you know, taken on the on the, on, uh, on the issue in the last uh, in the last three four years, it's totally illegal. So, and this illegality of Bulgaria's veto is a very powerful argument, you know, for for the Commission in Brussels, you know, to. Uh, asking you know, for some explanation at least, and they are asking, and they are asking this, you know, for already, uh, uh, for already uh, uh, seventeen months, I think. Uh, and one of the uh, major driving engines behind uh, the prime minister's efforts and everybody else uh, for this opinion in Sofia uh, is the prime minister's advisor on European issues. She is a former. Uh, uh, General Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Vesel Cherneva, a friend of mine, uh, uh, and a great friend of, uh, of, of Macedonia. And uh, she is also uh, a vice chair, chairperson of the European Forum for Foreign Relations. This is a, this is a think tank, you know, which is uh, basically very popular with uh, uh, most of the European uh, and British economy. Uh, your uh, uh, decision makers on foreign affairs, and I believe you know they they are doing the right job at the moment, but it's difficult. 
that would be a wonderful celebration if there will be Albanian Macedonian start of I negotiations. Cheers, Shivili, and Cheers. also to applaud you, Professor, for your contribution and your speech. Gazoo. And also the celebration. It's a celebration today. And the Gazoo first of May is a special day for all of us to celebrate EU enlargement. And I want to thank you very much also for your criticism that 2029 is too late. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, about the process, nobody knows, uh, but uh, uh, the, 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 the enlargement of 2004 was uh, somewhat a uh, tricky process. Uh, and one of the evidence for that was that on 30th of April, the Polish Sejm and the Polish Senate amended in one day 149 laws in order to join the European Union. This is very difficult to, to, to find the confirmation for that. You know, they uh, typically, if you look at internet, different sources and that sort of stuff, they will say that uh, the, 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 the Polish legislature, they did, you know, their best, you know, to get the country ready. So the funny thing was that they amended 149 laws in one day. So, why having this complicated process is totally unacceptable at the moment. You absolutely... The, 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 pro the process, legalistic side of it, did not change you know, since 2004. When we have, uh, we have a completely different situation, we have uh, Britain leaving you know, because of uh, 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 different complications related to this legalistic uh, nature of the union. Uh, of course, there were other things uh, uh, as a factor in this, and, uh, of course, you know, but uh, yeah, uh, Peter is, is taking the floor. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but, but, but uh, part of the problem is that the, the Union needs more freedom and more Britons than, 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 than for example, uh, I, I wouldn't give a bad example, you know, but more Britons than Hungary, I think. Absolutely. And uh, I want to explain the 2029. It comes from the point that normally EU enlargement in the case of Poland took 15 years from the end of the Cold War to 2004. It's 15 years. And so because of the Euromaidan revolution 2014, I calculated 15 years plus, and that's 2029. So that is the logic one of last 2029. Point, one last point about the war. Uh, Kremlin doesn't like Europe, Kremlin doesn't like the culture, political climate, and the values. Ukrainians and everybody else, you know, who is around this table and uh, who, 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 who represents basically the orientation towards uh, European values. Uh, that that that's the reason for the war. So how you respond to a war, which is motivated by 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 such reasoning, you just support these values. That's it. It's very simple. The situation is much simpler than it used to be in 2014. Unfortunately, with, uh, uh, with, with lots of victims. You know, this is what our President Kati has said very clearly, that EU enlargement is the answer to the Russian war in Ukraine, and that should be the line of the European Union. Peter has raised his hands. Please, Peter. I just want to exercise a note of caution that fast decisions are desirable, of course. Uh, however, we have, we are now experiencing the product of, being, of no regulation and, and no control in our economy. And uh, the oft quoted uh, entropy slowness of the EU, I think it's an entirely fair point that if you're going to make macroeconomic social and political decisions for 500 million people, you should take them carefully and slowly. We are now trashing human rights laws just because we can. So I think entropy and slowness, it, 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 caution is, is good actually. And I, I think if you're looking after a big group of people, you should carefully consider that. So I'm, I'm somewhere between the two of you saying, you know, don't just go fast because you can. Huh. Absolutely. Thanks, just, Peter. Yeah, just one, one moment. Second. One second. Yes. Please. So this is one yeah. thing, you know, taking economic or whatever uh, uh, 
exact policy decision. This is absolutely different thing when you take you know, a decision on uh, being a member or not being a member for new entrants. Thanks, Grassen. We have discussed now about the economic aspect and the wonderful progress that the countries of uh, New Europe have made in the last uh, 15 years or 18 years of membership. Now I would like to give uh, to Mr. Subotic uh, the floor and please your contribution, the Serbian perspective, the EU enlargement process. How do you see the situation? Before I continue, I'd like to, Gunta, to ask you, how did you, could you repeat the 2029 uh, perspective? How did you reach this uh, year? No, it's very clear because we have European Parliament elections every five years. So the next opening is 2024, 2029, 2034, and so on and so on. We can continue for the next 100 years <laughs> to uh, wait for uh, Serbia or for Ukraine. It's one option. And, uh, you know, there are some people in Europe who say we first have to reform the European Union <laughs> and to be somehow perfect. Uh, and then we have time for a new country. But uh, Kati and our group of uh, pro-European advocates, we say that we should be faster. I personally, I'm uh, like um, a student of Dr. Busek. He recently passed away and he was of the opinion to fast integrate all Western Balkan countries. I say immediately, basically. And he written a book about that one. But I personally say the countries which are foreign policy-wise aligned, that means NATO members, and that means they are with the sanctions on Ukraine who are completely according to the European common foreign security policy. That's Montenegro, that's North Macedonia, that's Albania. They should be already allowed to vote in the European Parliament in the next time, in 2024, with the countries where there are more structural issues, obviously, because in Ukraine there is war and in Moldova and in Georgia they are partly occupied. We have the issue of uh, Kosovo and uh, Bosnia-Serbian relation. It's all complicated, so I put 2029 as the target date and also as a clear incentive to make peace. Because if we promise to the Serbs and to the Kosovos, to the Bosnians and to everybody, it's 2029, but please sort the remaining issues out. So there is time to sort them out. And there is also a clear target that we are very serious with the new countries. And yeah, such a Europe would be then very attractive as well for the United Kingdom, because we could say, okay, there would be maybe a labor government coming in by 2029, they see we take more responsibility for our real problems in Eastern Europe. And then maybe the United Kingdom would say, good, this is the Europe of responsibility and we want to join as well. That's the reason between 2029. Okay, thanks. May uh, I for have the, a word? For the explanation, yeah. May I have a word on that? Yes, yes, yes. I didn't see who, is, who wants to say something, please. Bimo, Bimo Holland. Bimo, ambassador, of course, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, before going to this uh, uh, timing thing, uh, deadlines and, and uh, years, uh, let me emphasize once more, because I thought I didn't uh, do it uh, as I should, uh, showing solidarity with Ukraine and uh, to Natalia, and through her to all the Ukrainian people, uh, you know, we find no words to, to express our pain and, and bitterness what's, to see what's happening there and the enormous support that exists in Albania, uh, not only Republic of Albania, but all where Albanians live. And I noticed, it, noticed this thing with Albanians living in Austria. Uh, so full solidarity. Now we were talking about uh, uh, timing, 2029, earlier, later. Uh, you will allow me to be very frank and straightforward. Uh, the situation within European Union at political level is much more serious and uh, of concern than what we might think uh, in the first glance. We from Albania are telling them for two or three years, let's start talking, not setting any date. And people in the capitals of member states don't understand that we're not talking about membership. We're talking about the process that will help us, that will help us to come into line with European norms and standards that one day uh, will allow us to be members. So 
This message is not received yet that we are not talking about membership. We're talking about starting negotiations and they are not willing to do that. And it's, we are so much confused in Albania because we don't understand anymore how they function because they have set up a commission, which is the specialized body to uh, go out, judge, measure the progress. And then for five or, or, or six uh, meetings of the European Council, they do not trust their own, own institution because commission is saying, yes, Albania has fulfilled the conditions. And the, then the council said, no. And, uh, and maybe one thing that perhaps not all of you are aware, what we did, you know, Macedonia indeed made the, the biggest step by, by changing the constitutional name. But uh, it was not a, a smaller step what we did because of so-called, not so-called, but real trust. We noticed that there was a lack of trust about Albania being able to fulfill all the criteria. And two years ago, what we did with our judiciary, we have in the leading organ of the judiciary system in Albania, a foreigner sitting there. So it is considered to be the biggest concession on sovereignty of the country for the sake of becoming a member. So if there is any suspicion or doubt about the Albanian judiciary being able to, uh, to fight corruption or not, now we gave the, 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 the biggest uh, concession, of the, to, to say in other words, that the foreigner is sitting in the, leading uh, the, the three top uh, leading organ of the judiciary in Albania. And, uh, you know, this trust somehow is not being taken from Albania to European Union, because in my judgment, the, the now I'm becoming very personal, I see that the, uh, in the European Union, we are missing leadership. Uh, there are no people who, who can look 10, 15, 20 years from today. And they're looking after their narrow interests from one day to another, not from uh, one decade to another. And uh, I look very much forward that, uh, as you said, the June 23rd, we'll have a different decision by the European Council this year. But uh, there is no much uh, confidence in Albania that we will have a positive decision this time. And uh, the, the direction that we are taking is that let us do and let us behave as if we are a member and we provide the best what we can based on the European norms and standards to our uh, citizens. And then when they are ready, uh, let us uh, start ne negotiating. Because obviously we cannot force uh, anything on the European Union and simply waiting by uh, uh, fulfilling all the criteria. And it was a time that we were believing that geopolitics, uh, strategy, the influence of others, so-called third actors in the region uh, would be uh, an element uh, in the discussion that the uh, European Union uh, would uh, uh, speed up a little bit of decision making because the other actors who are active in the, in the area. Well, as much as I like the argument, I don't think that this should be the main decision making uh, force behind uh, the decision making argument behind the, the uh, the discussion, because first of all, is the criteria, have we fulfilled the criteria or not? Because if we hide uh, uh, behind the geostrategic, then a lot of things uh, are misunderstood. Of course, with the war in Ukraine, the aggression, the Russian aggression makes things more urgent to be seen in the light of the geopolitics. And the uh, it was indeed very interesting to see what Mr. Uh, uh, to hear what Mr. Cook said about the grand strategy of, of Russia. And uh, it's indeed a great concern that we all have to uh, keep in mind. But uh, in one word, what I'd like to say is that the, the being judged upon fulfilling criteria and act uh, in accordance with the values of the European Union should be the first uh, measure, uh, uh, measurement before the geopolitical considerations. Thank you. And I'm sorry if, if I took too much of your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. This was excellent uh, contribution and speech. And also thanks for the Albanians to be so clearly with Ukraine. Kati Schneeberger, at the visit you organized in Tirana, was able to visit the free Ukraine uh, street 
directly in front of the Russian embassy in Tirana and uh, also where the Ukraine embassy is. This is a very powerful symbol which Albania has done to rename that street and to be so uh, strong supporter of Ukraine. I understand your frustration that the EU is going too slowly with enlargement because Albania is a very strong ally and very much in solidarity has accepted all the things and has regulatory aligned completely. And the question is really, what are we waiting for in the European Union? Because all uh, the countries are ready for the European Union, similar like they were ready in 2004 in Malta or in Slovakia or in 2007 in Romania and Bulgaria. And we have to change uh, the foreign policy and the EU accession policy of the European Union. And that's the whole idea of this movement led by Kati Schneeberger to change the foreign policy accession um, consensus towards enlargement, similar like it was also in the uh, 90s possible to do that. And we have to create this thrust for the common house of Europe where we all united again. Thanks a lot now. Mr. Subotic has raised a hand. Yes, uh, I was going to uh, talk about uh, one solution that actually the European Policy Center has proposed, and we named it the model of staged accession. So we published it last year in October, and since then we've been to so many different EU capitals. Uh, uh, we talked to Paris, Berlin, uh, we went to, to Dutch, Swedes, uh, Czech, Slovaks, Italians, and Austrians, and so on. So I've been to Vienna recently as well. And I can tell you that the model uh, uh, at first uh, was seen as uh, uh, with uh, some level of reservation. However, uh, one uh, stakeholder told us that October of 2021 is not the same thing as February 2022, meaning that the EU officials are now more and more open to consider ideas on how we can incentivize the leaders to step up the game uh, in the region to step up the game in, the, in terms of rule of law, because we argue that although some countries may have uh, aligned with foreign policy, there is a lot of work in all Western Balkan countries uh, from the standpoint of rule of law, and this, this needs to be done before official membership. Uh, and that's why our model is not a shortcut for those who uh, don't uh, pursue uh, full alignment on rule of law. Uh, at the same time, uh, Serbia should also be incentivized not only in the area of rule of law but also uh, foreign policy and i'll tell you how we plan to do it so on the one hand we uh understand that the process has been ongoing for too long it's been uh, two decades in the western balkans uh, no tangible benefits uh, because the model is binary either you're a member or you're not a member so our model produces a more gradual integration uh, we talk about four stages in total so there are two pre-accession stages and two membership stages. The pre-accession stages would be regulated by the existing legal framework. So no treaty change would be needed according to the analysis of our legal experts. We would use the current the stabilization and the association agreements and the revised methodology as a good ground to actually increase on the one hand financial funds, financial structural funds, cohesion funds for the Western Balkan countries. On the other hand, uh, we talk about the gradual access to institutions of the EU. For example, those countries which have uh, aligned with foreign policy of the EU, there is no reason why they shouldn't be sitting with uh, uh, their EU counterparts uh, on meetings of uh, mutual and essential importance. So we do believe that these two elements, more funds and more institutional access, could be incentivizing for our leaders to actually step up the game and to finally perceive the enlargement as something which is uh, uh, quite uh, tangible. Uh, on the other hand, we also realize that the EU has legitimate concerns of how EU of 33 could, or 37, could function. Imagine 33 or 37 veto players. That, I can imagine, could be... a quite a realistic concerns in many EU capitals, not only Brussels. And that's why we argue that in the two membership stages, which we have named them, after a new, new member state sign, signs a treaty of accession, uh, they would acquire a membership status. Uh, their citizens would become uh, citizens of the EU. They would get four freedoms, passport, right to vote and stand for elections in the European Parliament, uh, and so on. Uh, however, we introduced uh, certain limitations, uh, three key limitations. 
the most important one is no veto rights in the Council of the EU. So temporarily, we would actually call for a treaty of accession to uh, make extend extensive list of uh, temporary derogations, which is legally feasible, to actually limit the veto rights of new member states temporarily uh, in the Council. Then we would uh, also temporarily limit uh, the new member states of having a commissioner and having a judge in the court of justice. We have done so to actually tackle the concerns that the EU of 33 or 37 would be dysfunctional. We would argue that actually uh, giving more time to new member states to actually accommodate and the conventional members to also get to know uh, the uh, new member states, I think this would allow uh, EU to become complete, to have new member states and to reform together from within, rather than just keeping the Western Balkans and other countries on the outside and just waiting for EU to reform itself uh, for who knows how much uh, longer. And finally, stage four, which is a stage in which new member states would acquire, uh, would take away the institutional limitations, which I have uh, uh, talked about. So I, I do believe that, that this is a way to go. Uh, this way, the new member states uh, would actually have a more realistic perspective of joining. Uh, at the same time, uh, new member states would not be a costly exercise for the conventional member states because it's the veto rights which are the key uh, reason why the conventional member states are afraid of uh, having uh, new members uh, joining uh, or joining the club. Uh, importantly, this would not be economically uh, costly for the EU. The entire budget uh, GDP of the Western Balkans is the size of uh, Slovakia, so it's economically feasible. It's legally feasible, as I mentioned, temporary derogations have been used in the past to limit the labor rights, uh, uh, for example, for seven years in the uh, new countries after 2004. There are also derogations from applying certain environmental uh, uh, directives and so on. So we are arguing that we should be creative, we should actually uh, be bold and actually use this crisis to actually uh, finally unstuck the enlargement because we agree with all of you that enlargement was and should be and should continue to be actually the most successful policy of the EU not only from uh, an ideological standpoint but also from practical standpoint because Western Balkans are uh, one of the key elements uh, for actually also tackling the Ukrainian crisis. I think it's a good thing that all countries in the Western Balkans have condemned the Russian aggression. Uh, not all of them have actually imposed the sanctions, but actually um, I'm quite optimistic that with uh, this model, I think that uh, the costs of imposing sanctions uh, uh, could actually be mitigated because the EU perspective would finally become a realistic uh, realistic chance for those countries which have been standing in the line in the queue for the past uh, two uh, decades. I tried actually summarizing the model uh, in this short period of time. I'll send you a link. Uh, it's called Template for Stage Succession, and uh, you can read it. Uh, it's now available in the chat. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mr. Subotic. That's an excellent idea. It's a kind of membership minus um, to, uh, for fast accession. And that's, um, um, I think, um, one feasible way to go ahead yeah? and to have a full membership, but under certain restraints and conditions, uh, which in a way Bulgaria and Romania had as well, because it was later introduced to have a supervised budgetary kind of, it's called certify, certified verification mechanism, yeah. which is something similar in a way, uh, but retrospectively. And if you take a look at the polls in Bulgaria and Romania, their citizens support this cooperation verification mechanism. Uh, it's a post-accession post conditionality, which uh, they believe has uh, helped their countries reform. And they also think that uh, this mechanism should stay in place because there is still more work to do. And in their example, we can see that they don't consider themselves to be a second-class uh, uh, citizens of the EU. And at the same time, our model would not turn Western Balkans into second class members because the institutional limitations which we have called for would be uh, temporary. It would buy us more time to showcase that we're serious members and also allow the EU more time to reform itself and potentially move away with uh, unanimity voting in some areas and potentially extend the QMV uh, areas in which this system could be used. So this way uh, we can have uh, convergence between EU reform and EU enlargement. 
There's also this excellent proposal of Gerald Knaus for the European Economic Area, but I think your proposal is more political integration with some caveats, which I think makes a lot of sense. I tend to reiterate that I also made a very important, I think, peace proposal. As an economist, I'm very much in favor of adopting the euro prior to accession in order to speed up uh, EU um, tangible results, because the voters of uh, Serbia, for example, would see that they have the euro already as the currency. And I have just today published it in Kosovo, the proposal for the recognition of Kosovo uh, to get uh, the euro as a currency for Serbia to incentivize and also have support the politicians if they want to be for peace, that they have something tangible to show to the population immediately. I'm also calling for the same policy in Albania and Macedonia and also in Ukraine to use the euro more forward thinkingly and now basically to stabilize Eastern European economy in the face of the war, but also show the population that we are very seriously with EU enlargement. Good, more questions and comments. I open the floor to some of the speakers. Have we a participant from uh, Georgia? And others from Ukraine? Well, I am from Ukraine. You're welcome. Make your statement. Are you for the EU membership of Ukraine? Yes, yes, but uh, I was already talking and I see there is ah, uh, one another person, Ksenia Pidruchna. I don't know if she is from Ukraine, but it seems like. Maybe no, not. She doesn't want to talk, no problem. Eh? Mm -hmm. Natalia, just uh, can you describe, because the situation has changed dramatically with the Ukraine war, because Mr. Zelensky is now such a powerful communicator. He has turned with the war into one of the most important personalities of the world. And he has decided with his appearance in the European Parliament to focus his uh, communication power globally on the EU membership of Ukraine. And this basically has transformed the whole accession process because suddenly such a powerful person like Mr. Zelensky in this uh, existential crisis of Europe, yeah. uh, where Ukraine is attacked by Russia and also the whole of Europe is threatened, Mr. Zelensky has devoted his energy not only on the defense of Ukraine, but also on the EU accession. And this is the only thing which really changes the debate here at the moment because mm -hmm. he has such a moral authority and political cloud at the moment that uh, Mr. Michel and Mrs. van der Leyen and Roberta Metzola, the three most important personalities of the European Union, have really gone out and said very clearly they are in favor of that one. We have a situation where the Germans, the Austrians and the French and also to some extent, uh, of course, the Hungarians, which are completely gone uh, in, towards the Russian camp, unfortunately, uh, but uh, the three most important countries in this debate, the Germans, the Austrians, the French, are very reluctant to grant this. But here comes the opportunity, and it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for the Western Balkan countries to piggyback on this powerful Zelensky store opening <laughs> effort, which is very hard for the Europeans from Germany and from France and from Austria to resist. Because why? Because the Polish, the Central Europeans, the Baltics, the Northern Europeans, and of course the Americans most of all, <laughs> are 100% now in favor of giving Ukraine this essential moral booster of a EU accession uh, perspective. And so my guess it will happen. But what is unfortunately the problem that the Western Balkan countries are not active enough <laughs> to uh, use this momentum and to also support uh, this EU accession uh, perspective, we should be all together in a kind of coalition for enlarged Europe. Yeah. And that's, I think, the opportunity here now. And that's uh, the second part of the debate. Can we use this momentum here? What do you think, uh, Mr. Ambassador from Albania and also from Serbia, also from Kosovo, can we use this momentum for peace now uh, that Mr. Zelensky has created? 
Can I just um, uh, introduce a colleague before that, that question is answered? Please, Peter. Um, I have my friend here, Irina uh, from UK, who works with me on the streets and in all sorts of other ways to, um, to turn the minds of the British people towards more global perspectives and more unified perspectives. Um, she's not a frequent speaker, so I won't force her into speaking, but uh, she has the great privilege and insight of having uh, lived in Russia originally. Uh, so um, she sees the pain of the Ukraine situation from a Russian perspective. But absolutely, Irina, I haven't asked you to speak. <laughs> if you want to, you can later on. But I just thought I'd introduce her. Thanks a lot. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. Very good. I see that a lot of uh, British people are interested in EU37 joining back. That's what we definitely support. And be sure we have all the efforts of welcoming you. But next time, if it's possible that you join fully in the European Union, that would be wonderful also with the Euro European currency and with the old foreign policy, that would be excellent. No cake, no cake. <laughs> yes, Peter, absolutely, you're correct. Yeah. Thanks, Irina, for joining our debate on and celebration for EU37. Yes, thank you for the a coalition of pre-accession from Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova and the Western Balkans. Can we make sure that also Ukraine and Georgia join the Central European Free Trade Agreement, the Regional Cooperation Council, and that there will be one uh, common visit maybe of the Western Balkan leaders to Ukraine that was discussed uh, by the new Prime Minister Tritan Abasovic from Montenegro. He has made this proposal and imagine what a powerful show of uh, United Europe that would be if all six Prime Ministers or Presidents had by train to Kiev to uh, support uh, Zelensky, who has basically done more than anybody for the possibility of enlargement to be really revitalized by his decision to use uh, the power he has now uh, to focus on that one. And it would be also very nice to say thank you to him also from um, the Serbian side. Maybe Mr. Supovic, can I give the floor to you and describe a bit the Serbian position because beyond all celebration, it is a bit complicated what we see with the lack of closing of the airspace. Yesterday, Mr. Vucic has nothing better to do than present some Chinese anti-aircraft rockets, which he recently acquired with the subsidies of the European Union taxpayers, as we see it in Austria, actually. And he has also bought some Russian fighter plans. So not everything is bright in Serbia on the European side. And maybe can you outline some of your perspectives on that one? Absolutely. Uh, I can tell you that it's true, uh, we've seen some uh, pro-Russian uh, rallies in Belgrade. However, uh, and these images have circulated the media. However, I'd like to point out that the, typically the extremists are the ones who are the loudest. However, the extremists are only few in number and that these images do not represent the overall position of uh, uh, citizens of uh, Serbia. Uh, in that regard, we also had pro-Ukraine uh, uh, protests, uh, which unfortunately, uh, pro-Ukraine uh, protests of support, uh, which uh, unfortunately uh, did not grab the attention, not only of domestic media, but of international media as well. It does not sell uh, as, uh, as well, because when something is extreme, it's easy to catch on to. When it comes to Serbia, I was actually cautioning uh, always against automatically disqualifying Serbia simply because it didn't uh, impose uh, sanctions. Because in Serbia, things are not uh, uh, black and white. Uh, I would actually argue that the structure is set up in such a way that uh, it's not about Vucic. We shouldn't talk about uh, his persona. I do believe that anybody, any other politician, had he or she been in his position, would have... Uh, chosen a similar, uh, a similar way of acting or responding uh, to, uh, to, this, to this crisis. And there are several reasons, uh, and not all of them are rational. It's actually uh, three elements. One is rational, the other one is emotional, and third one is a mixture of uh, rationality and uh, emotions. Uh, I'll start from uh, uh, emotions. Uh, definitely, uh, although uh, Kosovo is pursuing its path uh, towards the EU, 
Uh, it's been recognized by you know, half of the world. Uh, uh, for Serbians, if you take a look at the polls, uh, uh, any uh, official uh, recognition of Kosovo is unacceptable. So in that regard, they see Russia as a key ally uh, to their cause. And that's something, the, something that uh, comes to play as an important uh, emotion. So turning uh, their back against Russia fully by imposing sanctions, they would feel this emotion being uh, betrayed. The same applies uh, to the trauma of a NATO bombing from 1999. People still uh, have it in their hearts and minds and they, they see uh, Russia as a player who at that time uh, uh, would not accept NATO bombing. And uh, for this reason, they continue to argue that the bombing was illegal and uh, uh, something that was unacceptable Acceptable. So emotions play an important role. Uh, secondly, uh, the um, a mixture of emotions and rationale is the, today's uh, Russia's uh, opinion in the position in the Security Council of the United Nations. They are afraid that uh, if they turn their back against Russia, that Russia might uh, pull away their veto and then uh, they would lose their leverage over uh, Kosovo. And thirdly, the rational, the ra the rational approach is the energy. We are highly dependent almost fully on their uh, gas. They are owners of our oil industry here, majority stakeholders. So all of these elements showcase that uh, Serbia is not in a position to uh, easily and fully and quickly uh, align when, with the sanctioning mechanism. However, I would argue that I see uh, actually positive signs that Serbia is willing, but slowly over time, to actually align its position with the West. I'll tell you why. Uh, so far, we have endorsed two uh, resolutions in the United Nations. One, uh, treating Russia as an aggressor, and on, another one from uh, the humanitarian standpoint. I think this is historic because uh, two months ago, this was unimaginable. Serbia condemning Russia for anything. We haven't done any uh, something, uh, we haven't adopted any uh, resolution that even indirectly hurts Russian interests. So I think this is a good starting point. Then we aligned with six EU declarations. This was all, all also unimaginable. I've been tracking uh, uh, Serbia's alignment rate with uh, EU declarations. And since 2008, uh, we haven't aligned with any declaration which targets uh, Russia's interest directly or indirectly. So this is the second reason why I'm uh, optimistic that uh, over time Serbia could uh, slowly but surely change its approach and why it should be given a chance. Thirdly, we see the change in media. Up to the UN General Assembly vote, uh, you know, our media was saying, uh, one media even argued that Ukraine attacked Russia, uh, uh, pro-tabloid media. They were saying that Putin is there, you know, uh, is a hero, blah, 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 and so on. They were praising Putin. But after Serbia's vote in the United Nations, you see the change of narrative. Putin is not mentioned anymore in our, on our cover pages. Uh, the tabloids argue for caution. They're afraid of the escalation and so on. And finally, we even saw two days ago when Putin was uh, talking about Kosovo, how it's a similar situation in Donbass and so on. You saw tabloids even arguing that Putin stabbed, stabbed Serbia uh, in his back, that Putin is betraying Serbia by you know, using this as a bargaining chip with the West. So you can see that in just two months, Putin was a hero. Ukraine attacked Russia. Now we see uh, Ukraine fighting for its life and Putin betraying Serbia. So by building up this momentum over time, I think this will also give our government a more space and more maneuver to sell uh, certain uh, sanctions if they decide to impose them um, in the future. They wouldn't do, do it openly and brag about it, but they would still apply some sanctions. We've also applied sanctions to Yanukovych and his uh, 16 uh, colleagues. We haven't aligned with any sanction before. This is one. We have also voted to kick uh, uh, Russia from Human Rights Council in the United Nations. So this is another form of sanction. So th therefore, I would say that uh, a more careful look to Serbia's perspective shows a willingness to align, but uh, not as quickly possibly uh, as the West expects it to do. That's why uh, I'm arguing that Serbia deserves a chance and that we as civil society are actually uh, key allies which have uh, condemned the Russian aggression, but also who have uh, given uh, to uh, the EU more details on Serbia's uh, a particular uh, position uh, in this uh, geopolitical uh, uh, situation.
So yeah, hopefully this made it a bit clear uh, that Serbia is def definitely not out there to be easily uh, uh, disqualified. And I do hope that the West will uh, keep Serbia and other Western Balkan countries on their radar. We have the Conference of the Western Balkans under the French presidency. Then we have the uh, EU Western Balkan Summit uh, under Czech presidency. So as we talk, we talked about a model, model of stage obsession and other models, more incentives are needed for the costs of sanctions to be mitigated and also for the EU to be brought back uh, uh, on the agenda. Thanks. That was very, very informative and very good statement. Thanks a lot, Mr. Supotic. The question is also, is there a chance for a joint visit of the Western Balkan prime ministers to go to Kiev together? Well, two issues. One is the, you know, as I mentioned, the Serbia would impose sanctions, but would not brag about it. So this would be, you know, in a way, uh, bragging about turning their position against Russia. So they would do it, but not as openly. So that's why I'm skeptical about the visit. And secondly, I don't see Vucic just standing next to uh, uh, his Kosovo counterparts uh, in Kiev uh, when, you know, the world is watching. So that, that's, that's another uh, issue that complicates or decreases the possibility of a uh, joint uh, visit uh, to Kiev. Mr. Ambassador, you had a question? Not a real question. Uh, I uh, just wanted to add up to fill in uh, with the question that you asked about the peace uh, support and uh, joint visit to Kiev by Western Balkan leaders. I think, uh, you know, very much share Mr. Subatic what just said about the joint visit, but I think uh, all of us are going to act in their own small ways. Like uh, a few days ago, the Speaker of the North Macedonian Parliament, Mr. Talajapari, was in Kiev for a visit. And on, on Tuesday, uh, President Zelensky is addressing the Albanian parliament. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Rama has expressed his willingness uh, to be there anytime uh, possible and in any format uh, possible. So, uh, dear friends uh, and participants, uh, in Albania, we feel very much that this is our war too. And uh, I very much share what Professor, I think, uh, Kresen from Bulgaria mentioned that the, a little earlier that what Putin and Russia is doing in Ukraine is somehow fighting against what Ukraine was after, what Ukraine was watching the perspective. You know, it's the exactly the European values that were uh, being kind of developing there that uh, hurt Russia a lot. So uh, we feel that uh, in no way we uh, have the luxury of allowing uh, Mr. Putin and, and Russia aggression to, to succeed in even in the, the smallest way. So, uh, you know, I, I don't have enough information from uh, uh, Tirana and Albania. What are next steps in the in this peace uh, supporting initiatives? But uh, I can ensure you that all what is possible to be done will be done by by Albania. And, uh, and we have to admit that this is a very very difficult situation with, with uh, you know, frankly speaking. We all know what's happening, but long term, uh, it will backfire in such an enormous way on those who started this this war. Um, uh, what timing is difficult to say, but all this so so counterproductive. Uh, and I think one message has to be taken home by all Europeans and perhaps even the U.S. that. Uh, a long time ago, I have been dealing with security issues and the mantra uh, of all involved at that time was an ounce of prevention is much better than a ton of uh, uh, reaction to a, a crisis when it happens. And I think not all of us, I mean, not Albania, but all of us that are around this table or uh, the international community 
did not do enough to uh, prevent this at a time that it was obvious that it was coming. Uh, but if you remember, even in the few days prior to the aggression, there was very much skepticism. Now, is it true that they're going to invade? No, they're going to attack? No, yes, who has the information? So uh, I think more should be done in the future to, to prevent. And again, we come to this celebration that the uh, EU is a, such a formidable edifice that can protect everybody, can protect, can uh, give maximum protection for such things not to, to suffer in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Ambassador. This is the whole reason for this celebration, because the countries inside are safe. Uh, we have also the mutual defense clause, the Article 42 in the EU treaties, and inside the European Union, obviously economically, socially, but also security-wise, it's much safer. And that's why it's much fairer to be faster with EU enlargement to have Albania, Georgia, Moldova, all the countries inside the European Union. Thanks, Mr. Ambassador. I would like now to go to the how we can cooperate in the next eight weeks, because the next eight weeks are very important. We have exactly eight weeks for the 23rd of June. There will be the big summit. Do you think that we will have a breakthrough on the enlargement side in the next eight weeks? And what we can do between think tanks, politicians and diplomacy to really achieve it? And can we make some kind of joint activity on EU 37 in Serbia, in Albania, in Austria, Ukraine, to focus the energies of all of us together to achieve a breakthrough at this big summit at the 23rd of June? in eight weeks from now. Please, Peter. Unmute yourself. I have no right to say anything as a member of uh, Brexit Britain. However, I can urge all of you to not repeat our mistakes uh, and, and seek unity and do whatever it takes in the time. I mean, I said earlier that, you know, big decisions take time. But actually, when a deadline approaches, one has to unite. So I, I think it, it is time, uh, whilst we're away on leave, you need to uh, find a way to unite around this deadline. And that's, I dare, I don't have the right to even tell you that, but I've said it now. Oh, Peter, by the way, the United Kingdom is the most important European ally in NATO. And you are very decisive for everything that is happening in Ukraine. And by the way, you are one of the most um, powerful communicators in English. And if, for example, your movement is supporting EU enlargement and makes that a case, so it's that, also that, quite that, useful, to be honest. That, that is all we have left you with is, is our language. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and our aggression. Um, so and well, millions of activists uh, in Europe who are listening to you because sure. you have a good communication basis. So. I find it interesting that Mr. Johnson uh, is applauded very sensibly by Mr. Zelensky because he has to do this to everyone. But uh, the truth is rather more uh, uh, that Mr. Johnson is rather desperate, I think. Um, so uh, anyway, we're not going into boring UK politics. We left. Uh, we must get over it. Uh, but actually, seriously, if you have a deadline, now is not the time to uh, pontificate. It is the time to unite. That would be my... Uh, I would implore you to do that, actually. And we'll join... We'll, we'll help you wherever we can. Thanks I will second Peter. that. Sorry, Irene, I didn't hear. I just said I would second that. Very good. Please, um, Mr. Subotic from Serbia. Yes, I'd like to tell you that we as European Policy Center will definitely uh, continue advocating strongly in the next uh, two months uh, uh, for our model. Uh, we oppose some of the tendencies which we see of uh, certain models which uh, call for deeper integration without uh, official membership. We do believe that any such alternatives uh, could be damaging, considering that uh, uh, Western Balkan citizens uh, have EU projects as part of their DNA. You know, they would feel uh, betrayed in a way uh, if something is promised without guaranteeing a, a membership uh, in the future. 
while putting the membership uh, off uh, the table because it's not about money it's not only about exploiting the eu it's about becoming part of a european family and we should always have this in mind sometimes i'm surprised by some people or stakeholders uh, easily believing that uh, simply by giving money uh, that everything would be sor sorted out but i do believe that uh, you know uh, belong sense of belonging you know ending up you as eu citizens or, or having their voices heard in new institutions uh, is something of a, a big uh, value if you take a look at the for example at Euroskeptics in serbia uh, during the recent uh, presidential debates the a year skeptic club was actually or anti-EU EU club was actually calling for deeper economic integration, uh, something along the lines of uh, uh, EEA without official membership. They would be the happiest about it. So that's why put, put, uh, endorsing potentially any uh, such alternative model would only uh, contribute to EU skepticism to those who, would, who argue that uh, uh, we should never impose any kind of sanctions against Russia. That we, we shouldn't even condemn Russia. Uh, that's why uh, pro-EU movements, think tanks, and other organizations uh, should, uh, you know, should be endorsed by the EU officials. Uh, luckily, we as European Policy Center are quite influential, and we can knock on the door, and uh, we can have the doors open. But the other other countries, uh, other think tanks from the Western Balkans should also have their voices heard and uh, they should always remind uh, the EU counterparts of the basic fact, which is the EU membership should always remain a, a priority. Uh, and uh, that's why any other alternative uh, should be regarded as unac unacceptable. Absolutely, a clear yes to political EU membership of all the Western Balkan countries and Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia this is a very powerful message if the European Policy Center is clear on that. That is very helpful. Also, maybe you can help us with contacts to Bosnia, Montenegro, and also in Macedonia, because there's also many friends there, I'm sure, uh, who are pro-European. And that would be also very interesting for a future Zoom conference or for future events, uh, which we plan to organize in the coming eight weeks of decision making on EU enlargement. If we cannot change the German, French and Austrian positions in the next eight weeks, and then we might have a very, very big setback in the 23rd of June. And that would be setting back in EU enlargement for, for maybe a long time. So it's now very important, please. I, I'm quite optimistic about the French, to be honest. They were the first ones to openly welcome us, uh, both in Brussels and Paris. Uh, they even helped us uh, meet the current presidency trio with all the key institutions, and they were quite open-minded because they were the ones to propose the revised methodology. They see that it's not being operationalized. They do realize that opening a cluster, or closing a chapter is not a tangible benefit they were expecting for. What uh, we need is a roadmap for functioning of democratic institutions. Uh, and oh, as I mentioned, uh, opening up the institutional space and uh, opening up a possibility for additional uh, funds. They are open for it and they are actively talking to their counter counterparts in uh, uh, Berlin. I'm also sending you a link of our regional network. It's called Think for Europe Network. They're true allies to uh, the European cause. And if you need anything uh, from uh, uh, them, you feel free to contact them. It's a group of six think tanks from each Western Balkan country. Think for Europe Network. Very good. And also to connect this group with Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, because uh, now we will um, do several visits. I will go to Moldova next week and then end of uh, May, we will go, Kati Schneeberger and me, will go to Kosovo uh, to promote EU 37. I plan a visit to Georgia uh, to, in June. And uh, so to basically spread uh, a kind of coordination uh, message uh, that we all want to be united in the European Union, together with the British back, we will be 37. And that should be a coordinated effort of the foreign policy establishments, of the think tanks, of the activist movements, and then we will be much more effective together. Please, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, I, uh, um, I don't have much to say, but 
just wanted to inform about the visit of uh, Commissioner Enlargement, Mr. Berhai, that visited Albania two, three days ago. And from his public uh, statements, uh, one can reach the conclusion that it is very much up in the air. Uh, it might be a positive uh, decision for start, uh, starting negotiations with Albania uh, on June 23rd, but very much is open and maybe not. Uh, on, on the subject, what can and should be done? I think uh, the situation is rather complicated. First fact that I'd like to underline is that all of us in the region are in very different stages of uh, uh, rapprochement with the Union. Serbia, Montenegro, they have almost uh, finished the discussion about chapters. We have not started yet in Macedonia. And then Kosovo and Bosnia are even further away from that. So th there is, uh, what I'm trying to mention here is that there's not much ground for a common uh, effort towards the, the concrete steps to be taken because we, we, we have different needs. But of course, uh, all of us, uh, join you and, and the group here and many other uh, institutions and very much, thank you very much, Mr. Sobotis, for the uh, group that I, I make it known to other people in Albania, by the way, that which they might know already because they are very much in, in connection uh, uh, network. Uh, so in addition to that, what makes me be a little cautious on what can be done is the fact that uh, if you watch the support in public opinion about the enlargement in countries like even including Austria uh, is not something that we can rely upon building uh, a momentum for enlargement. And, uh, it requires more leadership rather than, uh, rather than public support. So I think what I can say from Albania, what we are aiming at is uh, reaching the uh, top decision makers uh, more intensively during this time and uh, trying to make our case that uh, it will be only in the benefit of the European Union if they, uh, if they start the process of uh, accession, uh, not necessarily uh, uh, mentioning a date for accession. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to end here saying that uh, we still are hopeful for, for next uh, European Council, but uh, not certain. And uh, it looks that we're going to, to point to aim uh, more at the uh, decision makers at the highest level rather than uh, appealing the public opinion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Of course, it's not decided. Yeah, of course, it's unfortunately not decided. And of course, we will need support by the Americans. It's absolutely essential that the American powerful diplomatic effort is pushed behind the EU enlargement. And that's absolutely decisive that this is happening. And also the British, actually, that they very much support EU enlargement perspective in the coming eight weeks. And Peter, you have raised your hand. Yes, having argued that complex decisions require time, I'm going to argue the reverse of this. Um, the musician Brian Eno talks about simplicity. So does Einstein, of course. He says, I have one bar of soap for washing and shaving. Yeah, things should be made uh, as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, what I found is um, one of the more persuasive arguments I had with people in this country and have still is the notion that it costs uh, 37 pence of our British pounds to belong to the EU for 70 plus years of relative peace. Now that's a really simple point, um, but actually for people that don't have the education, that's actually the one that's stuck with them. So we all have our complex arguments, but it, it, where a deadline approaches, I think we need to borrow Einstein's principle of simplicity to explain that half a chocolate bar is all it costs to belong to this union for all this social and other benefits. So um, I'd urge you also to borrow from Einstein. 
Absolutely. Thanks a lot, Peter. It's quite simple. We all want to be in the European Union. I was personally active as a student uh, in 94 in the campaign for EU referendum of Austria. And our country has tremendously developed uh, because of EU membership. We are much more open, prosperous and successful nation. And the same is true for all uh, the members of the European Union, the 13 countries which have joined in the last 18 years. And now there's nine new countries which have this wish to join and they would benefit a lot but we all would benefit a lot from a larger market and the more secure eastern europe because the costs of such a terrible war are enormous on human life on financials on the damages so the security of eastern europe that's what the european union ultimately is made about and that's why we have it <laughs> to secure eastern europe and to give them a prosperous stable framework uh, for a good life and uh, that's exactly what we have successfully done with the first 13 uh, countries now the next nine countries to come and we are very happy with the leadership of Kati Schneeberger a young rising and uh, upcoming uh, politician from the Green Party from Vienna to be the president of Vienna Goes Europe this NGO she has started this consultation process in the conference of the future of Europe in Austria, especially to involve all the new countries as well to be involved. And uh, because unfortunately the EU has decided to not involve them, but Kati has made this effort and is now very active in the Green Party to promote EU enlargement. And in the next eight weeks to build a network of all the nine countries together with the UK to influence these decisions via the Austrian Green Party, via the German Green Party, via also all other parties, obviously. But this is a good opportunity. And if we are all very active now in the next eight weeks, maybe we have this big achievement of opening the European Union and setting up a decade of EU enlargement, which has been so beneficial for us in the 2000s. And then we had lost a decade in our internal crisis and if we can re-energize and revitalize uh, the spirit of the 2000s, of 2004, of the 1st of May 2004, that would be really very good economically, strategically and socially as well for everybody involved. And that would be another 67 million Europeans safely inside the European Union. It's not uh, then, of course, if the UK comes back, it's another 67 million. But first of all, the priority also, Peter, understand, is to secure the Eastern European fragile periphery inside the European Union. And that's, of course, so important. So that was the call for EU 37. Whatever you can do in your communication channels, in your diplomatic networks, in uh, your various countries, please do that. And now for the next eight uh, weeks, we have really this opening, this historic window of opportunity for EU enlargement. And if we can achieve it now, then the life of 67 million people will be much better. And ultimately, it will raise the prosperity of all Europeans. Obviously, it will lift the boat for all of us. Now, I would like to say thank you very much to Kati Schneeberger. Maybe one closing remark. And also, thanks for your leadership for organizing this event and more to come from Vienna Goes Europe. Kati, the floor is yours for some closing remarks. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, participating. Um, it was a very exciting discussion um, and I wish you all a nice Sunday and I'm sure we see each other again um, to talk about EU uh, 37. Maybe also, Kati, to invite everybody to the European Day because you make a very big effort on the 7th of May in Vienna, on the streets of Vienna. You transform the streets of Vienna in a European celebration together with many of the enlargement ambassadors already present. Maybe you can invite everybody to join that event. Just unmute yourself. No, you're not unmuted, but uh, maybe it doesn't work. But on the 7th of May, Kati is organizing at Maria Hilferstraße. That's only for the people in Vienna, obviously. But a very big uh, EU European Day uh, event. And that's, of course, fantastic if you can take time 
to join. It will be focused on Ukraine. There will be a lot of uh, enlargement uh, activity. And that's, of course, a big celebration. The 9th of May is a Monday. And that's the European day. Let me make the point that 9th of May is not a Russian victory day because we in Europe, we celebrate at the end of World War II on the 8th of May. And the 9th of May is our European holiday where Jean Monnet has declared the fundamentals of the European Union. So we will do it now on the 7th, but um, please uh, make sure that whenever in your country sits the 9th of May, that should be the European day to be celebrated. And by the way, Russia will not win this war. Ukraine will win, Europe will win. We will enlarge the European Union and by the way, NATO as well. And we will certainly win uh, this battle against Russian aggression, Russian authoritarianism and uh, the aggression of Putin. And I always call this, um, uh, close these events with Slava Ukraine. Please do whatever you can to support Ukraine's victory.